Hello everyone. My name is Rochelle Dunwoody. I'm the president of the Ohio Valley Volleyball Officials Association located in Cincinnati, Ohio. I've been a certified PABO line judge for over 15 years and today I'm going to take you through my line judging experience. My learning objectives for today's presentation is as follows. I want to review the history and the collaboration of the Ohio High School and the other governing bodies of volleyball regarding certified line judge training opportunities. I would like to cover the basic responsibilities of line judges and the mechanics as prescribed by the Ohio High School Athletic Association. I'm going to give tips and suggestions for R1s who are working with volunteer line judges as well as when they are working with certified line judges at regional and state tournaments. I'm also going to share some tips and suggestions and opportunities for current certified line judges. And if you're currently not a certified line judge, my goal is to encourage you to become a certified line judge by attending some trainings in the summer that are offered by PAVO and a few advanced techniques for those who are currently certified to having certified line judges in Ohio High School Athletic Association. Did you know that several years ago the volleyball coaches began to recognize the importance of line judges on volleyball officiating crew? they requested more trained and qualified officials. As a result, they asked the Ohio High School Athletic Association to help increase the quality and the quantity of line judges working their local matches as well as their state championship matches. The Ohio High School Athletic Association looked at several opportunities to address this request and respond and responded by implementing a line judge program. Instead of reinventing the wheel, it was decided that, to, that it would be more beneficial to use the current certification program that had already existed through PAVO, which is the Professional Association of Volleyball Officials. They had already created a program for collegiate line judges. So with the help of the NFSH, PAVO, and the NCAA, the same techniques and mechanics of line judges were being used. But then we had an issue about how are we going to get the multitude of line judges certified and trained. And that's when the local PAVO affiliated boards came to the rescue. Because we have so many boards around the state, the training and the certification process was able to meet the new demand for aligned judges. And between all three organizations, we were able to provide tons of opportunities for new officials to learn how to become certified line judges. In all, it was a win-win for both organization. The pool of certified line judges have increased significantly and the Ohio High School Athletic Association line judges have greatly benefited from the PABO training program because it's by completion of the PABO training program that Ohio High School Athletic Association gets its certified line judge for regional and tournament play at the end of the season. So now that we have the history behind us, let's dive into the program that we will be covering today. So we're going to look at the characteristics of a line judge. We're going to talk about what equipment is needed, the attire that should be worn, pre-match basics, some positioning, some end of the match techniques, some end game techniques, um, some, some procedures, advanced topics, and we're going to look at the PAVO certification program that has brought us here today. And then I'm going to provide you with my contact information 
just in case you have questions. So what's characteristic of a good line judge? First of all, I believe that a great line judge is relaxed but attentive. They are calm, they are cool, and they are collected. When the ball is not in play, they're usually standing upright, getting refocused for the next play. When the ball is in play, you can see them angling their body, moving their feet to adjust themselves so they can play, call the play that's in front of them. Next, they are flexible, meaning they are very mobile, they're athletic, they're agile, they have the ability to adjust their focus and move with purpose. They have the ability to avoid the flinch when a ball is coming at them or near them at 75 miles an hour. They have the ability to make strong and confident calls. They sell their calls. They leave no doubt about what they saw. Their signals are crisp. And then they present their signals by standing upright in a very professional way. They have really good eyesight. They have the ability to track the ball with their eyes. They anticipate the path of the ball based on their abilities to read the hitters and the different situations. And finally, they are dependable. They have knowledge of their position. They, have, they make a decision on every play. They're there when the R1 needs them on those bang bang plays, as well as the routine, easy, balls in or out. The perspective of a line judge is very unique, and that's probably why I enjoy line judging so much, because I feel like I'm a part of the action when I'm out there on the court. But it's very important as line judges that we know our responsibilities in determining faults, and then wisdom, crisp signals, and following techniques that are prescribed by the Ohio High School Athletic Association. So now that we know what the characteristics are for a great, for a good line judge, let's look at what equipment is needed for a line judge. So to be a good line judge, all you need is a set of flags. Many certified line judges and professional line judges have their own set of flags that they keep in their toolbox. Flags are relatively inexpensive and I personally like the Molten and the Mikasa with the golf grip. However, if you're an R1, you might be working with a volunteer who does not have their own flags. So remember, typically the whole school or the, R or the R1 may provide them for the match. But then there might be some matches where you don't have flags and as the R1 you're going to have to show your line judges how to make signals without flags, which we'll cover those signals later in this presentation. Your job as a line judge is very important to the officiating crew. So when you are scheduled to work as a line judge, you need to dress like a line judge. White polo shirt, white shoes, white socks with black pants. You're an official. You're going to look like the other officials. So now that we know what equipment that we have and need, now that we have our equipment and we're dressed for success, let's discuss our pre-match duties. Your pre-match preparation should begin as you're driving to the facility for your match. Your health, your attire, and your appearance are all factors that will affect you as a professional and the image that you will project the night that you're working. Ohio High School states that the line judge should be on site in uniform 20 minutes prior to the match. However, during our current pandemic, I suggest getting to the facility about 30 to 45 minutes early to provide time for your health screen or whatever else that needs to happen. In addition, arriving early will allow you to assess the, your surroundings, check out the court markings, check out the lighting, 
and anything else that will help you prepare mentally and physically for your match. Remember R1s, if you're working with volunteers, we will be lucky if they will arrive five to ten minutes prior to the game. And so we must be prepared to have a quick pre-match conference with them. And as we get later in this presentation, I'll give you a quick guide to help you with that process. So once you're in uniform and you're at your site, you're going to, the certified line judge is going to head to the scores table and introduce themselves to the referees and the scorekeeper. The R1 will probably ask you about your experience, see how long you've been officiating or line judging, have a little conversation. Then after that, you'll probably do your pre-conference, pre-match conference, where the R1 will talk about assignments. If you haven't not been assigned, he or she will go ahead and make those assignments to tell you what line you're going to work that night. Then they will probably briefly discuss your duties, your signals, and discuss any personal preferences of handling in-match situations that they need to discuss with you. For example, if your server comes close to your corner, do they want you to go back up behind the end line or do they want you to go on the sideline? So they will talk about those items in your pre-match. As a professional official, we always warm up our eyes prior to the match. So this activity gives line judges a chance to mentally and physically prepare again for the match without flags. So while the teams are warming up, attacking, and serving, the line judges will go to their lines, and then they will rehearse the calls that they see. So whether it's in, whether it's out, whether it's touch, and then just kind of get a feel for the, the corner that they're going to be working that night. And they're going to do all of this without hindering the warm-up for the girls that are still on the court. In addition, Warming up your eyes give you the opportunity to see the speed of the game and also pick up any player tendencies. And what I mean by that is if you have a server that likes to serve from the corner, you'll be able to see that. If you have a server that likes to uh, serve cross court or do like a little U shape, like she comes outside of the court and inside of the court to make her serve, you'll be able to uh, see all of that as well. So your eye warm-up should be about three to four minutes of both teams. Um, so that, again, this will allow you to just kind of see what's going on, who you have in front of you, and then what their tendencies are. Typically, volunteer officials will not perform this skill because of their arrival times. However, it's important to encourage or communicate this responsibility just in case you have a volunteer who is interested in picking up line judging as a hobby or gets there early enough to perform this activity. So the pre-match positioning. So most matches that you will work will use two line judges. Each position to the corner on the right hand side of the referee at the intersection of the sideline and the end line near the corner of the court. That is our base position. At the start of the match, the line judges are usually positioned about 10 feet away from the end line. And they kind of hang out there with their flags or a ball if they're using a four ball system. If they're not using a four ball system, then they're just there with their flags. Until the R2 gives the first server the ball. And at that time, you're just going to hang out in your base area. Now, I don't believe that my animation is accurate because both of them are not coming in at the same time. But once the R2 bounce passes the ball to the server, both LJ1 and LJ2 will go to their respective lines.
As I said earlier, both line judges are responsible for a side line and an end line. And that way they can cover the entire court. The LJ2, this is the LJ2 side line, and this is the LJ2's end line. As we talked about earlier, every once in a while you'll have a server that likes to serve in your area. And so in the pre-match conference with the R1, they will tell you whether they want you to go extend your inline extension or if they want you to go sideline extension. You'll have that conversation with the R1. So usually if I have a server in this area here, I'm just going to watch her. And then when she makes her serve and gets back on the court, then I'm going to come back to my area of responsibility nice and quick. So by a picture, it looks like this. So I'm on my inline extended. Once she makes her serve and then gets back on the court, then I'm going to quickly retreat back to my base position. Next, we have the timeout position. During the timeout, both line judges will be at the intersection of the attack line and the sideline on the R1 side of the court. The line judges will roll up their flag and determine if they will hold them in front of them or in the back of them, waist height. So in this particular situation, it will look like this. And again, I don't believe my animation is as accurate as I would like, but this is the base position for the LJ2. They would go up to the sideline and then both LJ1 and the LJ2 will meet here and then they will both walk in together. They will stand at the intersection of the attack line with their flag facing the scores table in their hand. And if they are requested by the R1 to hold the ball during the timeout, the team that has to serve that line judge will be the person that will be holding it during the timeout. Now during the timeout position, R1, if you're working with volunteers, this is a great time to uh, work with them or express uh, an emphasis of a technique that you want them to focus on for the rest of the match or if you feel like they've been doing a great job, this is a time that you can give them a little quick feedback, whether it be a thumbs up or just verbally telling them, hey, keep up with it. If they have not been doing a great job, you can encourage them to you know, be better for the, the next half of the, the set. And then once the R2 blows the warning whistle, which is typically about 45 minutes um, into the timeout, both line judges will leave the attack line and then go back to their bases for the next particular play. So now we're going to look at signaling. When a fault occurs in your area, you're going to make the call. You're going to stand upright and you're going to present the signals and make good eye contact with the R1. In the event that you get overruled on your call, just quickly lower your flag and prepare for the next rally. Remember, it happens to all of us. I've been overruled and I'm still consider myself to be a great line judge. It happens. Sometimes we just miss it. But we need to be ready to make a signal on every play. So if the ball contacts the floor inside the court, we're going to call it in. If it lands on the line, we're going to call it in. If the ball touches a player and then goes out, we're going to call a touch. If the ball contacts the floor outside the court and does not hit a player on that side of the court, we're going to call it out. If the ball hits the antenna, we're going to give the antenna signal. So let's talk about those areas of responsibility. So as I said before, each of the line judges 
have their own end line and they have their own sideline. So this is the area for the LJ1. This is their area of responsibility, so they're calling throughout the match. The LJ1 should never call balls that hit in this general area because, again, as we said, the making of a good line judge is your ability to sell that call. And if you're 35 feet away, it's going to be hard for you to sell this call, even though there are some times that you can actually see the ball hit. But refrain from making calls that are out of your area. All right? Line judges. Both line judges can make calls when balls hit in the center of the court, on both sides of the court. They can call touches wherever they see them. So the ball ricochets off of a player, and I can see that. I'm going to call a touch wherever those may happen. Both line judges can call antenna fault. So we just want to make sure that we're staying in our area of responsibility so that we can sell those calls. And again, the LJ2, their area of responsibility is this sideline and this inline. So they should refrain from making calls that are in these this areas. All right. Moving on. The coffin corner. So as I said before, each line judge will have their own sideline that connects with their partner's in line. And in this respect, if the ball lands here in the corner, both of my line judges should be giving me a signal. And the same happens if it falls in this corner as here. It's in this intersection of the LJ1's end line and the LJ2's sideline. The ball lands here in this corner. They both should be giving me a signal to let me know what they saw. Okay? Next, there are situations where the two line judge will make two different calls, and that's perfectly legal. Again, in this particular situation, the ball is outside of LJ1's sideline. However, it is inside LJ2's inline. LJ2 will make an end call. LJ1 will make the out call. And the R1 knows that if we have an out and an in, two different signals, that the ball is ruled out. So the R1 will make the out call, and then we will continue as our match. So next we're going to look at the individual signals. And I will try to replay these so that you can kind of get a good look of what the line judge is doing to make the proper call. So let's start off with the inbounds play. I'm just going to play the video. And just like we talked about. So in this particular situation, the R, the LJ2, which is this official here, line judge, this official line judge here, um, as you can see, as the play kind of develops, there's a situation that a ball um, gets played and close to the ground. So you'll see her make movement right there so she's making a good movement to see that ball that was dropping here in the middle of the court just to make sure that it wasn't down so she's putting herself in a position to see that then she quickly gets herself back into her position gets ready for the next play and then the ball is attacked right in the coffin corner and 
as you can see she nice and easily here let me see if I can rewind it a little bit so there you can see the ball land the kind of the shadow there is the shadow of the ball you can see that the the LJ2 the line judge in this particular instant is in a very athletic position she's looking inside the line and she's going to quickly make a signal by pointing the ball pointing the flag down towards the middle of the court and then she's gonna stand up relax take away her she's presenting her flag now to the R1 the R1 makes the call and then she's nice and easily going to uh, drop her flag um, so that's the end signal so let's watch that again And there she is. A uh, good end call. Well done. Next, we're going to talk about the out of bounds signal. I'll show you the video. Again, the line judge adjusts for the movement. And then that ball is blasted out of bounds. So again, the line judge is moving with purpose. So the ball almost hits the ground. It's a little tip over, so he anticipated that it might be short. Moved very quickly to see it. And then now the attacker hits that ball, and it's clearly out of bounds. You can see that. And then the out of bounds signal, the line judge here, LJ1, is going to raise his flag with an arm extended and he does that really nice very athletic stance and then raise the flag arm extended and then turn presents to the r1 so that's your out of bounds signal next we're going to do the touch signal And the ball is ricocheted off of the player number seven. And then you see the official, the LJ1, comes up nice and quick and gives the out of bounds or gives the touch signal. So we're going to watch that again. Ricochets off, quickly stands, presents to the R1. So when we're making the touch signal, we're going to raise the flag shoulder height in front of our body and then place our open palm on the other hand on the top of the flag. So it basically looks like you're making a T is what I always say. So when I'm making my touch signal, I'm making a T and I look just like this line judge here. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about the antenna fall. Uh, this video has two great things about it uh, so first we're just gonna watch the antenna fault and then and during the match we're gonna talk about how to keep yourself uh, safe when players are coming uh, in your area so first we're gonna look at the antenna fault signal and digest that one first so this is what it looks like ball hits high off the block players return it and now it's hit the antenna and as you can see in this corner here this line judge waves the flags over his head and then points at points at the antenna so let's check that out again so right here you can see he's waving the flag and he's pointing at the antenna waving the flag oh, I didn't cut that off what all right so he's waving the flag and he's pointing at the antenna well done all right but I like this video because when we talk about during the match procedures we're going to talk about an errant pass and being alert 
and this video has them both. So when we talk about being alert, you'll see here that once the ball gets blocked really, really high, you now see that the line judge has taken a step back from his base position. You'll see the line judge has taken a step back from his base position. Now, right now, he's doing two things. He's, he moves with purpose because he wants to avoid the players that are coming, but he also stayed within his sideline. But then he has another player that's coming too to get the ball, and so he stops in his track as not to get too far away or hinder her from playing the ball. So then, immediately when she plays the ball, she retreats, and then he quickly comes back to his base position, and now his partner gets ready to make that antenna call. So that was good awareness and being alert to stay out of the situation there with the players running off the court after an errant ball. So the next call that the line judge gets to make is a service line fault. This is primarily one of those calls that's rarely happens, but we have video to say that it did happen or it could happen. So in this particular instance, I want you to see it, then I'll slow it down for you. I love that. So now we are going to go, and you'll see the player tosses her ball. And now when she takes that big step, her, her foot is now in contact with the end line. And then you'll see right after the big flash, the line judge will come up really quickly with his flag very similar to the antenna fault call. He's going to wave the flag over his head and then point at the service line. And then the R1 will take that call and award a service fault, a point to the other team. So again, here is the contact. And then right after the big flash, there is the signal. Okay, so he's waving his flag and then pointing at the service fault. Very good. The next call that we have basically means that I'm blocked from view, which means that someone or some person stepped in my, way, my line of vision as the line judge. So in this particular video, LJ2 over here, um, there's a ball that gets hit out of bounds over here, and he's going to come up with the block from view uh, signal. Um, typically, as line judges, as I said before, we want to move with purpose, and we always want to be able to make a call on a ball that's affecting one of our sideline or inline. And so we have to have a little bit of anticipation when something like that is going to occur. But we're all human, and sometimes we think that we're going to, we're in the good spot, and then all of a sudden the player just steps right in our way, and we can't see it. And so this means, this call here means I am blocked from view, not that I have, can't make a decision. I didn't, I can't make a decision because I can't see anything. All right, and it goes, look, it looks like this. Ball is blocked. The line just comes up pretty quickly. Ball is blocked. And there's the signal. I'm going to raise my arms, cross them in front of my chest with my palms facing my body. That is what that signal looks like. And then in that situation, hopefully your partners all have a good view of that. So then we get the call right. Okay, so that's the signal for block from view. Again, usually rarely happens, but on occasion you're not going to be able to see it. Again, this is the block from view, pause, and then give the signal. Very done. well done. Okay. And then next, as I said, as the R1, you might have to teach a line judge to signal without flags. And so these are the signals that you would use. So basically signal number one, you would basically just wave your hand 
to obtain the referee's uh, attention. For the inbounds play, you're going to just put both hands into the court, in the center of the court. The out of bounds or antenna violation call is very similar to the out of bounds signal that you would make as an R1, as well as the touch signal. The line violation signal is a combination of uh, numbers one and five. So I'm going to point to the line, but then I need to wave so I can get the official's attention. And then the block from view signal is basically the same. You just don't have a flag. So those are the signal, that's the signals that you would use when you're using hand signals. So I don't have flags. So as we said, during the match, there's a lot going on. And the official has to be ready to make a play, a call on a play every single time. So they want to take some time to reset their focus in between plays. And so my analogy for this is when I'm working as a line judge, I'm working from whistle to whistle, from the beck and whistle to the fault whistle. I am working as hard as I can. During plays, I am refocusing, getting myself ready for the next play. One of the major things is as a line judge, I want to make sure that I'm getting my eyes ahead of the ball. So I want to see the line before the ball contacts it and that way it will help me determine accurately if the ball was in or out. As we viewed in the last video, uh, teams are chasing errant passes so I need to move if I need to move and then I need to return to my corner as quickly as possible. Um, and then with that I just want to make sure I'm alert and be aware that players are running, what direction that they're running in, do I need to move to see, and then how quickly can I move back to my posi base position, and if I'm moving out to get out of the way of a player, can I still maintain one of my lines to help my team call that balls in or out that intersect that line. Most importantly, if I don't have an opinion on a call, I'm not going to mimic my partner. I'm just going to make good solid eye contact with the referee with the R1, and then typically the R1 will talk about this in their pre-match. So we're not going to mimic calls. We're just going to call our area of responsibility. Anticipating pancakes by reading tips and off-speed off shots, as you saw in several of the video clips that we had. You saw the line judges anticipating pancakes, um, rolls, and tips to try to get themselves in the best position to make that call. So those are the types of things that you would do as a line judge. And then on touch calls, you want to stay with the ball as long as possible, but you also need to beat the ball to the line because this is a line judge training, because you are a line judge, you are not a touch judge. so. Remember, you're working with a team that if you missed a touch call, hopefully a member on your team, a member on your team has that touch call. But most importantly, your job is to get to the line and call balls in or out. So those are the things that we want to do during the match to help our partners be successful. Between sets and end of the game procedures. So in between sets, professional line judges will gather the balls and then go to a position near the first referee stand, which is basically your timeout position. Once the players change sides, you will walk along the 10-foot line to the scores table to return the ball. That's how it is in a normal game pre-COVID. With COVID, teams probably won't be changing sides. But once the intermission is, once the court is cleared, then you and your partner will walk across the scores table, walk across the court to the scores table to return your balls. When there is a minute left in intermission, you will return to the court and return to your base position. Provided you have a neutral seating area which is away from the fans, players, coaches, and spectators. 
if that area is not provided, then you will return to the timeout position and then wait until the intermission is over. R1s, if you are working with volunteers, you want to encourage them to go to a neutral area as well. But if they're parent volunteers, they're probably going to want to hang out with their family members, just chat a little bit. But again, we want to encourage them to get to a neutral area since they are still working. At the end of the match, we need to have an exit plan. Uh, for professional officials, you're going to follow the plan that was discussed by the R1 in the pre-match um, conference. If you borrowed flags, the flags will be taken to either the locker room or left at the scores table or returned to the event management, however it was discussed um, at the beginning of the match. Typically, all the officials will participate in the post-match review. Um, this is a great opportunity to figure out as a line judge some of the things that you did well in the match and then some of the things that you need to improve on. And if there's just like certain situations that happen in the match, it's a good time that all the officials get to uh, talk about those. As a line judge myself, this is one of my favorite things to do after a match is get together with my colleagues and talk about what happened in the match. And a lot of times, if everyone is able, we typically will do this at some type of restaurant because match debrief and food are a good combination. If you have volunteers, Typically, the R1 should ask them to find the R1 at the end of the match so you can acknowledge their effort and then thank them for helping out and answer any questions that they may have after the game because typically volunteers are usually going to peace out right after the, the, the game is over. So some general reminders regarding your duties. Remember to have fun. It's really important to have fun. I mean, we all have a job to do, but there's nothing in the rule book that says we can't have fun doing our job as line judges. And I believe that being a line judge is probably one of the most funnest things ever, if funnest is the word. Avoid behaviors or body languages that may appear too relaxed or indifferent. So as a line judge, you shouldn't be playing with your flag. You shouldn't be waving at your friends. You shouldn't be on your phone. And then again, there shouldn't be any social media that you're discussing which match you have and the events that happen during your match. Uh, remember, if you get overruled, don't let it stop you from getting the next play right. So remain poised, drop the signal, and prepare for the next play. As you saw in the video, don't snap your flags back after you make a call. Just nice and easily relax your signals. Um, and then get ready for the next play. If an injury occurs, um, make sure that you stay away until the injury is resolved. If the injury is taken like two to three minutes or three to five minutes, it would probably be best if you can go to your timeout position. And then one of the key things, as we talked about with the errant pass or being alert, uh, just making sure that kids are not diving into your area as you're making an end call. Um, so you don't poke anyone in the eye. So make sure that you're alert, of, alert and aware of your surroundings when there's a play next to you and the player is coming in your area. If you hear an inappropriate comment from the bench or from the stands, uh, report that to the nearest referee when the ball is out of play. And then this is going to be hard, believe me. If you line judge or referee in the same place quite often during the season, uh, but you are required to refrain from engaging in conversations with coaches, players, and spectators about calls. If there is a question about the call, just make eye contact with the first referee. A lot of times, this is probably in my career as a line judge, it's probably been the hardest for me uh, because I like to, I don't like to ignore people. But when I go to the same gym, a lot of times, you know, people, you know. They get to know who you are, and they want to talk to you during your – coaches want to talk to you when you're warming up your eyes, and you have to be very professional and, you know, keep your poker face and don't engage in conversations with them. Um, and they, they typically know that they're not supposed to, but 
we're all humans, and so we just want to say hello, thanks for doing our match, or whatever they want to say. And I almost forgot. So remember, R1s, if you're working with volunteers, prepare yourself. Prepare yourself for the volunteer that you have that isn't making any calls. Prepare yourself for the line judge that is being dishonest or inattentive. Prepare yourself for the line judge who, once you overrule them, the volunteer, that they actually just walk off the court. So remember, you have the ability to replace line judges who are not performing up to your expectations, and the host management can help you with that. But I will tell you, it's kind of startling if someone walks off the, off the court when you're during a match. So just prepare yourself for that so that you um, are ready for the unexpected. So lastly, let's recap the duties and the responsibilities of our line judges. As I said before, sometimes when you're working with volunteers, they're going to be brand new and probably have never done line judging before. But if you, as the R1, use the set, the SALT technique, you can get them ready to officiate that match and do a pretty decent job. If you are working with certified line judges, this is also a really good review to just make sure you're all on the same page for what you're doing. So the S in SALT stands for server or serve and footfall, so they're watching the server. The A stands for the antenna, and then any part of the mesh outside of the antenna. The L stands for the lines, so they have to call the lines in and out. And the T stands for touches. So if the ball touches a player on the same side and goes out of bounds, that is a touch. So really quickly, the salt will get everyone refocused on the, the most important things that they need to do in that match, uh, to get them through the match. And then again, when you're working with volunteers, I always say make sure that you find ways within the match to acknowledge the work that they're doing. Um, they may not be perfect, but they are volunteering. And so one way to keep them engaged is to make sure they feel like a part of the uh, officiating crew by you know, making eye contact with them, um, giving them a thumbs up when they make a great call, um, staying with them if they make a bad call. Even if you have to overrule them, do it in a nice way. You don't have to show anyone up. So that recap should be able to help you get through those responsibilities without any problems. So next we want to talk about some advanced opportunities. As I said before, we need more line judges. We need more officials, period. But throughout the summers and the spring, Local PAVO affiliated boards, as well as NCAA conferences, host line judge training clinics and certification tournaments. The clinics include viewing the PAVO line judge training video. It includes reviewing the training manual. And at the completion of that training, you are also um, take a test to see how much knowledge that you've gained. The certification tournaments offer opportunities for line judges to be trained and evaluated during on-court live matches. Then your certification process is completed when you join PAVO as a member, and there's, there are different types of membership. So when we look at the PAVO page, you can check out the membership. The PAVO membership opens the doors to a variety of line judging opportunities at the collegiate level and is recognized by the Ohio High School Athletic Association when recognizing post-season line judges. So in the event that you don't get to call the game at a state or regional tournament as an R1 or an R2, it's even more gratifying to do it as a line judge. So you have the ability to do that. So if you go to the PAVO.org website, and look up line judge certification, this page will come up. And it basically, PAVO gives you a purpose of why they have this line judging program. And there are two different levels. So there's a basic program, and then there's a national level program. And then when we talk about the national level program, this is a criteria for that. There's also training camps and clinics that help you become a national line judge. As we all know, the sport of volleyball has been advancing in recent years. The matches are getting more competitive. The players are more skilled. The game is 
being played faster and faster. So as we have a higher level of expectation of play, so comes that expectation on the officials who are to make sure that they are prepared and then well trained. So line judges and referees alike, we must all be able to keep up with the advancements to contribute positively to our sport that will benefit our participants if we are up to speed with the advanced techniques such as positioning and movements, proper focus to identify touches, communication techniques, because the higher the level goes, the more we are required to meet those standards at that level. So when we talk about advanced techniques, uh, the two that uh, we just talked about here is your ability to see the block as a line judge. So in this picture, you'll see that the line judge is in a great spot. They're in a very athletic position with their eyes focused on the blocker's hands because if you're trying to judge touches off the block, the blocker's hand will be the best place to look. So you can see where she's looking and she would be able to determine if that ball was touched off of the blocker's hand or if the hitter just basically overshot their hands. The next technique that I wanted to mention is what I like to call getting your eyes inside the line. Um, this technique can seem very counterintuitive at first. However, if you apply this technique, it will greatly improve your ability to judge balls that land close to the line more accurately. So on the sideline and on the end line, if you position your head as she does in the, in the picture, looking at the line from inside the court with some type of body lean, this will allow you to more easily see the small gaps between the back of the ball and the court boundary lines. And in this particular situation, this picture, you can see that the ball is just out. However, when you look at this from the outside in, so from the outside of the court into the court, the ball will just seem like it's basically touching the line, which makes that an inaccurate call. So you want to make sure that you get your eyes inside the line, inside the line, get your eyes inside the line so that you can see the gap between the court boundaries and the ball. Next, we're going to talk about the antenna off this person. Um, and in this particular video, let's watch the video and then I'll discuss it afterwards. Let me make sure the sound is off. Violation of giving BYU a two-point lead. All right, so let's watch that again. So as you can see, the line judge is going to move to see the antenna, and then immediately he's going to point in the direction, which means that, hey, the ball hit the antenna, and it was off the team that's furthest away from me, which is the team in the dark blue. If he would have given the antenna signal and then pointed with this flag hand, that means that the ball hit the antenna, and it was off the team that's closest to him. So let's look at that again. He does a really good job of moving to see the antenna and then getting into a spot and then helping the R1 with that extra information. Lastly, we're going to talk about movement. And it's very important. Line judges are agile. Um, they're very athletic and they have the ability to move. But we don't, we don't want to move for just moving sake when we are line judges. So we want to move with purpose. And in this video, as the videos that I've seen that I've showed you earlier, you can all see that each of the line judge that left their base was moving with purpose. So in this particular situation, we want to move with purpose and then keep one of our lines in order. So the girl is coming at him, he backs up, he's watching the ball, and then quickly gets back to his line. So that way he will be in, ready to make the antenna call that's happening in both um, line judges had that antenna call on that particular situation. So let's look at that again. So he moves, keeping in line with his end line, and then quickly runs back to the court so that he can prepare for the next ball, very athletic, and then make that solid 
and tentacle. So in conclusion, volleyball is volleyball no matter the level. So I want to thank the Ohio High School Athletic Association and the other governing bodies for coming together to create this line judge certification program. I believe I have been greatly benefited from the, the learning that I've gathered from all organizations. It has helped me gain confidence in my line judging abilities and it has increased my contributions on the officiating crew by going through the PABO certification program. Yes, I believe I covered all the basic responsibilities of line judge and mechanics. I also believe that I provided a few tips and suggestions for officials working with volunteers as well as certified line judges. I believe I, I shared a few tips and suggestions for current line judges in terms of their further development. And only time will tell if I encourage all non-line judges viewing this presentation to become certified. Well, I believe that brings us to the end of my presentation. I just want to thank everyone for their help. If you have questions that you'd like to discuss, you can reach me at this, my email address, or you can give me a call. That would be great. I love to talk to people. And then finally, I couldn't have done this all by myself, so I want to send out a special shout out to Mike Behrens, um, my buddy in Nebraska for allowing me to use his video library to help us get some visuals on some of these techniques. I'd like to thank Rick Brown and Diane Place of Ohio High School for allowing me the opportunity to participate in this online training program during this COVID. And I want to thank all of my friends, line judges, colleagues who were displayed in this presentation for their outstanding work as a line judge. It's been great working with all of you, and I look forward to seeing you all again on the court very soon. And to USA, PABO, and the NCAA for allowing me to use some of the verbiage out of their training manuals and videos for this presentation. So with that being said, thanks everyone. It's been fun. I am so grateful for the opportunities that the Ohio High School Athletic Association has given me as a line judge. And I hope that you have similar experiences as you continue your journey as a certified line judge. Take care, everyone. Yeah, I get to line judge now. <laughs>